Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, I want to give you one. Uh, we have them here at the church to give away. If, you, if you're watching the screens, I'll pull up some of the scriptures on the screen. But um, in this series, it's the last in our series, Drama Free Zone. And we've been learning about why we have drama. You know that all of us have drama. At some level, all of us are drama. And we have to learn how to deal with drama. And uh, the reason why we have drama is events happen in our life that create emotions and impact our relationships. And everyone we know also has that. So we have to learn how to deal with drama. I've been asking you, where are you on the drama scale? Are you somebody who adds drama? You say, well, I don't add drama. I don't gossip, but do you like to hear it? Do you invite drama? You say, maybe you say, I'm zero drama. Okay, but that's not even the goal. The goal that God wants to teach us is how to diffuse drama and then become peacemakers. And you heard me say, if we learn how to deal with drama, here's what I think. One, you'll live longer. I think that drama actually takes years off your life. Secondly, you're going to be happier. Would you agree? (laughs) When you don't have drama and you have peace that you're happier? Here's another one. Uh, Your relationships. You're going to have more friends and your family will thrive. I also believe this. In your professional career, you'll get promoted if you know how to make peace. But biggest, you know what's the most important? People see Jesus. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called the sons of God, or the children of God, the sons and daughters of God. So that's how people see God, is they see us, because the message of the gospel is how God made peace through Jesus with us. And when we receive that grace, not only do we have peace with God, but we become peacemakers in this world. And so that's been the heart of this series. And uh, each week, we've been walking through five rules to make our relationships drama-free. And so, uh, aren't you glad that we have kids here? (laughs) Can we thank all the moms and dads that bring children here? I think that's so, it's not easy. It's not easy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, We talk about harsh words. How do you deal with harsh words? You have to speak life. Okay? We're not going to be people who speak negative. Have you found negative people find each other? Uh, we, how do you deal with gossip? Spread good news. A church that's busy spreading good news is too busy for gossip. How do you deal with jealousy? You celebrate others. When you celebrate others, it roots out jealousy in your heart. Last week, how do you deal with conflict? We say you go face to face with grace. Face to face is the best. Second best is voice to voice. Text to text is not good. This is what peacemakers do. We go face to face. When possible, we go face to face with grace. And we do it and say, God, this is for you. Today, I want to talk about the fifth and last in the series, and it's probably the most secretive. I want to talk to you about resentment. And each week, I've tried to have an honest statement about myself. Remember, I went to write this series about how you guys needed to change. And along the way, God said, no, you need to change. And so I started to write down things about myself, like, I like gossip a little bit more than I like to admit. It's like French fries. I said, I'm a little jealous of somebody close to me, and you'd never know. I said, I mostly blame others for the conflict in my life. What would be a true statement about you? When it comes to resentment, I wrote this down this week. I have a little bit of resentment hiding in the basement of my heart, and I call it stress. Raise your hand if you have a basement. Where am I? Who's got a basement in their house? You got a basement? Who's got a basement? Okay, all right. When's the, what, what's in your basement? You don't know, <laughs> right? Like, like, I don't know what's in my basement. We don't have a basement, but we have a downstairs closet. Do you have one of those? Like, seriously, the goal in life is to never open it because there's stuff in there. I don't know what's in there. It could be like a whole family living there. I don't know, pack of wolves. Open the door. You, try, you know, it's like there's this, there's this stuff that kind of hides out in the basement of our hearts and lives. And resentment is one of those things that hides in the basement of our hearts. If somebody said, do you have any resentment or unforgiveness? You would say, no. But when's the last time you went into the basement? And I say, I say it, 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 that we call it stress, meaning this. Um, you have stress, I have stress because we have pressure in our life and there's you know, things that are pushed upon us and there's anxieties and things that we have to think about. But some of what we call stress, that heaviness is actually resentment and we've forgotten that it's there. It's just heavy. In Proverbs chapter 23, verse seven, it says this, a stone is heavy, sand is weighty, 
But resentment caused by a fool is even heavier. Some of us, the heaviness that you feel, that stress, that, that weight is actually a little bit of resentment. And you say, well, you know, if you ask me, so I was, I'm writing this series and I'm writing this message. Wes, is there someone that you need to forgive that you haven't forgiven? I'd be like, no, I've, I've forgiven. I know the Lord's prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. I've, I've forgiven. But is there anybody that you resent that you had to forgive? Now, part of you, it says it's unfair. Maybe it's somebody uh, uh, that got... Uh, they, they stole something from you. Maybe it's somebody that, that broke up with you, hurt your heart, an ex-spouse. Maybe it's a child that you poured out into. They never said thank you and they never poured back. Maybe at your workplace that you were wronged. You worked hard, somebody else got the benefit from it. And there's a little bit of resentment in your heart says, that's not fair, that's not right. Oh, I forgive them, but in the basement of my heart, there's a heaviness. The Bible tells us that this is bad, and not just for us, but actually it'll corrupt everyone that we know and love in our life. And if you could get rid of that resentment from your basement and clean house, would, you be, would this be worth our time today? Would you be open to the Holy Spirit going into that closet that you've kind of set aside and pulling some of that stuff out and getting rid of it. In Hebrews chapter 12, um, there's a scripture there that talks about um, what happens when resentment takes hold in our heart. And I'll start with verse 15, Hebrews 12, 15. And maybe you want to read it with me as it comes on the screen. Would you read it with me? Look after, let's read this together. <laughs> that part where we read it together. <laughs> Aloud. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God and watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting. Okay, let's pause here and talk about this scripture. Notice there it says this, look after each other. This is why you're part of a church. You're part of a church because why? Because you need, we need each other. Are we better together? I'm telling you, you ever try to parent by yourself? At some point, your kids aren't listening to you. So I'm like, where are other people saying the same things? I remember my, my kid will come home and say, Dad, you know what Karsten told me? And I'm like, I told him that. <laughs> okay, that's part of being, now here's the other part of it. This is we all have blind spots. People say, well, I know my blind spot. That is the most blind thing anyone could say. They're called blind spots. They're spots that are blind. You don't, they're blind. They're spots. You don't see them. <laughs> so look after each other. That's what we're doing. If you notice someone's missing, can you just like check on them? Don't be like, I wonder if Wes is going to check on them. Can you imagine if I'm like trying to check on everybody? I can barely take care of myself. <laughs> look after each other so that none of you does what fails to, what's that word? Receive. Receive. For every hurt, injury, harm that's been done to you, there's grace. God, it's not fair. God's like, there's a day I'll make it right. In this time period of where it's not right, here's what I have for you. It's called grace. Did you know you can miss God's grace? It says, watch out for each other. So that no, no one fails to receive it. And watch out that no poisonous root of, what does it say? Bitterness. I was studying roots because I'm not like big into farming or planting or other things that involve the dirt. And I learned there's two types of, of roots. You have fibrous and tap roots. Maybe there's more, but I learned at least two of them. Which one of those two do you think would be harder to pull? Isn't it interesting that the taproot is really difficult to pull? That's the one that kind of gets in there and it's just so hard to pull out. It's drought resistant. You, you, anybody ever like go up and you see a, some dandelions in your yard and you go and you pull it and the whole root just pops up with it real easy? Never. <laughs> taproot, dandelions. 
Those are those uh, parts of resentment in your life, and you've asked God to help you forgive somebody, and all you've ever done is pop the top of the dandelions, and the roots are still there in your basement, in your heart, weighing you down. Watch out. Look after each other. Make sure that no one misses the grace of God. And that no bitter root grows up in you. And what does it do? It will trouble you and corrupt many. That bitterness will actually harm not only you, but everyone you love. What if we could get rid of it today? Continue reading. It says this uh, next script verse. Read it with me. Make sure that no one is immoral or godless like Esau who traded his birthright as the firstborn son for a single meal. You know that afterwards, when he wanted his father's blessing, he was rejected. It was too late for repentance, even though he begged with tears. Bitter tears. Esau. I want to take a moment and just kind of unpack Esau's story here with you and talk about resentment because he's somebody who spends much of his life battling this resentment. And uh, any, anybody here twin? Anybody got, got any twins in the house? Or you had twins? My, my dad was born a twin, two pounds and 13 ounces back in 1944. <laughs> he got bigger. <laughs> and uh, so, so Isaac and Rebecca are these parents that want, are actually this married couple that wants kids. And they're unable to have kids for 20 years. So I don't know how long you've been praying to have kids and you don't have kids if you want kids. But they were going for 20 years on this. Um, last Mother's Day, we had people um, in our Mother's Day PM gathering who want to have kids come for prayer. And we prayed over people. And would you keep praying? How cool would it be in 2020 Mother's Day to hear great reports of people who are now having children because God blessed them with that? I do know this. Last year on Mother's Day, one of the couples in our church got up here and shared their testimony. And I love what one of them said. They said this, we're praying for kids. We want kids. But in the meantime, while we don't have kids, we've chosen to love your kids. <sighs> if you're unable to have kids, have been unable and want them, you can connect to Isaac and Rebecca. 20 years of prayer, and then she gets pregnant with twins. And the Bible says they're struggling in her stomach. Now, uh, when my wife got pregnant, um, at first she was just like, I'm pregnant. And I was like, how do we know? And she's like, look, you know, there's that strip and there's the color. And I don't even know if it was supposed to be pink or blue or what, but whatever it said, she's pregnant. And, um, but then I started noticing she got bigger. Baby started growing. And then that's kind of scary too, because like your pregnant wife comes up and she's like, I feel big. Do I look big? And you're like, um, should I say yes or no? <laughs> and, then, and then there's those nights she's laying down and she feels all this like stuff inside of her. And she's like, oh, feel this, feel this, feel this. And, and I, I couldn't feel nothing. She's just like, no, feel this, no, feel, it. oh, did you feel that? So I learned to say, wow, yeah. <laughs> Oh, man, feel that. Woo. I do know when they came out, I could feel it. <laughs> Rebecca gives birth to twin sons. The first one born is um, Esau. And he's born, and it's a kid. You ever have a kid born with like a full head of hair? That's Esau. Came out, said like, he had so much hair, it was like a fur coat. He looked like Sea Captain Wes. <laughs> His name actually means big, red, hairy one. Like, well, let's call you Esau. And then, and then Jacob's born second, and he's holding his brother's heel. And so the name Jacob means literally heel grabber, which in their culture also means deceiver. And these boys are always wrestling, struggling for who's going to get blessed. I don't know if you have kids that wrestle or struggle or kind of fight for. And what we also have is this, is the Bible says that um, Esau was uh, into the outdoors and he loved to hunt. And so his dad loved him because his dad loved to hunt and he loved the food that um, his son would make when he came home, the wild game. Um, I was in North Idaho for a few years and I'm not like a big hunter and everyone there hunts. In fact, the second largest Sunday of the year was Easter. The largest was the wild game feed. 
Like everyone hunted. And there I was right, like there's all these Esau's and I was like Jacob. I was really good at helping mom at home and uh, sewing. And that's what you see with Jacob here in, in Genesis 25 is this big difference between the two of them. It says in verse 27 that Esau loved the outdoors, but then it says that Jacob loved to be inside. And it said that the father, uh, Isaac, loved Esau, but the mother loved Jacob. Well, one day, um, it says that Esau went out hunting, and when he came back home, um, he uh, was starving. He hadn't actually killed anything, didn't have anything, and he was just so hungry. Um, and so as he comes home, he's starving, he's exhausted. And we see that at this, Jacob was cooking some stew. Now, I don't know, um, I had Hungarian goulash one time in Hungary. Oh my goodness, it's amazing. What else is amazing also is from ever Trader Joe's, the turkey chili? Oh, I just picture Jacob's making Trader Joe's turkey chili. <laughs> and I'm coming home from a long day of hunting and pastoring. And I'm starving. I'm so exhausted. Oh, give me some of that food. And what we see right here is really kind of the first of what I call Esau syndrome. And in the message, it says this, watch out for Esau syndrome. What's Esau syndrome? Well, the first is this, is that you're not satisfied. You're tired, you're hungry, and you're empty. And I just think that all of us are more tempted when we're not satisfied. If you're not satisfied with your marriage, you're going to be tempted. When you're not satisfied with your family, not satisfied with your job, not satisfied. In fact, one of the things that God teaches us is contentment as well as godliness. Contentment isn't like that you don't want to grow or don't want to achieve things, but it's that you enjoy what God's given you. If you can't enjoy what he's already given you, you'll never enjoy what, what, what you're searching for. And so we have here, Esau is not satisfied, number one. And so he says to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of that stew, that red stew. And that's how Esau got his name Eden. Now remember, God said there's going to be like two sons, there'll be like two rivals of two nations. Well, Esau is Edom, and you have from Jacob comes Israel. So he says, he said, Jacob says, all right, I'll give you some stool, but trade me your rights as the firstborn son. Now, who are my firstborns in the room? Where's my firstborns? All the firstborns in here. Okay, all right. So in this culture, um, firstborn sons specifically would get twice the inheritance. Does that sound like that's a good rule? And so I want you to think about this. Twi so, so Jacob is like, I will give you a bowl of stool, a stew. <laughs> I'll be here all weekend. <laughs> and all you have to do is trade me your birthright. <laughs> Who would do that? <laughs> and so Je uh, Esau says, look, I am starving to death. I am dying of starvation. What good is my birthright? I want that bowl of stew. <laughs> So Esau swears and gives him the birthright. And that's why I see number two, Esau syndrome, one is you're unsatisfied. Two is this, is you act impulsively. Anybody ever buy something and the next day you felt bad? You're like, I shouldn't have done that. Anybody make a trade and you're like, oh, that was a bad trade. I mean, growing up, my sister would trade me. She would, she would give me nickels for my dimes. So if you need a financial advisor <laughs> and some stew, come see me. <laughs> so Jacob gives Esau the stew. Esau eats it. And notice this. He begins to show contempt for his rights as the firstborn. But never trade in the moment for what you want most. Don't trade for a bowl of stew. Temptation always promises what it cannot deliver. That one night stand, that shortcut, that cheating, whatever it is that you're tempted towards, it's not worth it. Three, he regrets his decision. And immediately there's regret. 
Well, what happens is there comes time where his dad's going to die. And so there's the birthright, but there's also the blessing. And the ble- so the birthright deals with possessions. The blessing is really the father's affirmation upon you. And in that culture, the blessing is probably worth more than even the birthright. Well, dad's going to die. He sends off Esau to go hunting to bring back some wild game. He's going to eat a meal and he's going to bless them. And while he goes off, Rebecca goes to Jacob and says, listen, your, your, your dad sent Esau off, but I know that you traded, right? And um, if you want to, let's deceive your dad into getting the blessing. This is family drama. And so he uh, dresses up as Sea Captain Wes. He goes in, dad thinks it's Esau, blesses him with the firstborn blessing. He runs off and then Esau comes. Dad, I'm ready for the blessing. Dad's like, I gave it to your brother. Look at verse 41. From that time on, Esau hated Jacob. And he began to scheme to kill him. Do you have drama in your family? Here's what we're going to do. I don't have time to unpack all of this storyline. I'm going to take the next four weeks going through Jacob and Esau, and we're going to do a series called Under the Hood, which if you love cars, you're going to love this series. But we're also going to go under the hood and look at the stuff in our lives and in our families so that God can actually bring peace in our homes. And this leads actually to a place where Esau resents Jacob. Who is it that stole from you, hurt you, deceived you, wronged you, and maybe you've forgiven a million times. God, I forgive him. Help me forgive him. Pastor, would you pray I'd forgive him? But really, you still have a little bit of resentment in your heart. How do you deal with it? Okay, I'm going to give you this rule number five. Plant good things to push out resentment. You actually, it isn't just about clearing all of the weeds out that ground that's empty will just, those, those weeds come back. You have to plant good things there. And the way that Jesus said it, he says two things. He said what? He says, pray for your enemies and bless those who curse you. Does Jesus say to trust the person that wronged us? Didn't say that. He said to pray for them and to bless them. Here's what I noticed. When I was going through, and I said, I have a little bit of resentment. It's deep down in the basement of my heart. I, you know, and I call it stress. This last weekend, what God put on my heart to do is begin to pray for this person and these people by name. And to say, God, how do you want me to bless them? Oh, because I've forgiven them. I'm just a little bit upset that I had to do it. What about you? Am I the only one on this? Here's how important it is. When we will bless and pray and plant good things to push out resentment, here's what it does. Number one, it'll break the cycle of hate. As we go through this storyline the next four weeks, you're going to see the cycle of hate. At some point, you have to say, this stops with me. I'm not passing it on to my kids. Two, it'll keep Satan out of your life. Often we talk about strongholds where the devil gets in. He's got a stronghold. But where do strongholds start? They all start as footholds, small. Third is it, it disarms evil. It, like, it takes away the poison. You ever, you ever seen the movie Aaron Brockovich? And there's the whole, the water gets poisoned and the people are getting tumors and sick and they don't know why it's in the water. Resentment is in the water and it poisons the family. When we bless, when we pray, when we plant good, it takes the toxins out. I want to ask you to do this. Would you plant something good this week towards somebody that you currently have a little bit of resentment that you might have said you've forgiven, but honestly, you're still upset that you had to do it and you still have to say it's not fair and there's a little bit of weight hiding in the basement of your heart. Um, This last week, and I'll end with this, we... um, at story time, we're working through the story of Jonah, and uh, Jonah resents Nineveh. They're the uh, cap, they're kind of like the largest city at the time of Assyria, and uh, it's actually probably the largest city in the world at that point, the known world. 
Um, he, he resents them because they're known as this like vicious, evil people. And Jonah would have been from a north border town. So he would have had stories of people that he knew that were harmed by them. So when God said, get up and go to the land of Nineveh, he actually goes in the opposite direction. As far as he can, he boards a ship in Joppa to go to Tarshish, which would have been Spain, like the end of the world. It's as far as he can think of going for where God's called him. Can you imagine if God called you to bless somebody that you currently resent and how far you would go from that? He gets swallowed by a great fish. He gets spit up back on the beach, beach camp. And he gets the second chance. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Second time, what did Jonah do? Did he do it? He did. But what did he miss? He preaches for the people to, to, that God's judgment's coming. The people repent. The king repents. They even have their animals repent. And what does it say? God has mercy on them and compassion. And this makes Jonah so ha- upset. Oh, I drew a little bit of a chart for the kids in our tent at story time. And you can see there, often we think of listening as like, that's the highest level of what God wants from us. He wants us to hear his voice. Actually, I put it in the middle. Listen in the middle. Because, you know, really, the wise builder and the foolish builder, which one of those heard the word of the Lord? Both. The foolish builder doesn't do it. And Jonah goes further. He runs away. Jonah, the second time, does he do it? Yes. But where does he never get to? Compassion. That resentment that's in the basement of your heart will keep you from the compassion of God. There were two people who needed to be saved in this story, the Ninevites and Jonah. And when we started this church, we said, okay, we want to spread the gospel to all of the people who aren't a part of a church anywhere. And one of the first things that God had us deal with is this, is all of the people who've grown up in church, who've learned all of the stories, but they don't have the compassion of God in their heart. So I'm going to have you do this. I'm going to have you do what I did with all of the kids on, on, on Thursday. So would you go ahead and stand? And I um, had all the kids bow their heads and close their eyes. And then I looked around the room. And then I had to say it a second time because there were still kids with their eyes open. <laughs> kind of like you guys. So if you bow your head and close your eyes. If you're here and you have a little bit of resentment in the basement of your heart, I'm going to ask you to do what I asked those kids to do. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and ask God to get rid of it and to fill you with compassion. All over this room, if that's you right now, raise your hand up. Up in the balcony, in the bleachers. Okay, now I'm going to, I'm going to do what I had to, keep your hands up. I'm going, to have, I'm, going to have, I'm going to do what I do with the kids. I'm going to start on my right, your left, and I'm going to look across the room. And this is what I had the kids do. If your hand's up, I want you to put your head up and look at me. And when we catch eyes, you can put your hands down. Yes. 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 All the way in the back, yes. Yes. Go and put your hand down. Down here, yes. 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 My right, your left bleachers. I see you guys catching your eyes as best as I can. Yes. 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 All the way up there. Yes. Down on the floor in the middle here. Yes. 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 The bleachers in the middle. It's like, catch your eyes, yes. She'd put your hand down. Yes. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who've hurt you. Plant good where evil. Do not become overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Yes. 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 Go ahead and put your hand down. Yes. 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 Thanks for keeping it up. Yes. Over on my left, your right. Yes. Yes. Feel the weight come down as you put your hand down. Yes. 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 All the way against the wall. Yes. In the bleachers. Yes. 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 Go ahead and put your hand down. Yes. 
Yes, yes, yes. All the way up the top there, yes. I can't quite see you guys, but if you're in the balcony right now, is your hand up? Looking across there. Okay, I see you. Go ahead and put your hand down, yes. Yes, yes. Imagine a church filled with the compassion of God. Grace in, grace out. The message of the gospel is that while we were still sinners, the enemies of God, Christ died for us. Where there was resentment, God filled that with compassion. It's the message of the cross that overcomes evil. If you're here and you'd like to receive Christ today as your Lord and Savior and give your heart to God, he had you here on purpose. Today is your moment to raise your hand and say, that's me today. I received Christ. I want to join the 307 kids who said yes this week. Would you raise your hand now and say, that's me today? All across this room, who would like to receive Christ? Raise it up. Yeah. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you do a miracle in this room. As we sing, that you go into that basement Open that closet and take out that resentment. And this week, fill that with something good. Something good. Send out your people as your hands and feet to plant good where there's been evil. To pray and to bless because we serve a God who's blessed us. Meet with your people and let the weight come off as we worship you. Let's sing together. I believe.